When you go into a season, and when, you, when you're working with the team and planning a season, how, how do you measure success? Success is based on your expectations. And I believe that we will continue to be able to ramp up our expectations and then beat those expectations. And I believe we can win a World Series right here in Seattle in T-Mobile Park. Welcome back to Taking Care of Business. I'm Mike Katz, president of the business group at T-Mobile. Today, I have the real honor of talking with John Stanton, chairman and owner of the Seattle Mariners, in addition to a bunch of other things. John is the ultimate Washington State local. He went to high school just down the street from the T-Mobile headquarters in Bellevue, Washington. After college, he attended Harvard Business School and then jumped into wireless in the early 1980s making him one of America's wireless industry pioneers. In 1994, he founded VoiceStream Wireless, which later became this little old company right here, T-Mobile US. Today, John is chairman and owner of our hometown team, the Seattle Mariners. He's chairman of Trilogy International Partners, a private equity firm that invests in early stage ventures in wireless. And he's on the board of Microsoft and Costco. And that is just part of it. John, thank you so much for being here. I have to tell you, I've been looking forward to this for a long time. You know, you're somebody that I've looked up to for many, many years as CEO, as owner and, and chairman of the Mariners, as all the work that you've done as investor. So I, I have to thank you so much for doing this with us today. Well, thanks, Mike. It, it, for me, this represents a homecoming, right? The uh, opportunity to have T-Mobile be the naming rights sponsor, to, to have this be T-Mobile's home in baseball is, such a source of pride for me. And every time I see a bunch of folks with their magenta tees in the uh, building, I go over and introduce myself to them because at my heart, I'm still a T-Mobile person, even though I've been gone 20 years now. So it has been 20 years since Deutsche Telekom bought Voicestream and launched T-Mobile in the US. When you did that transaction and thought about where this company potentially could be 20 years later. How, how does that compare to what's happened? That's a great question. And from my point of view, I really think back further. I go back to 1979 when I started in wireless as a consultant, then in 1982 when I started at Macaw Cellular. And for us, that was an opportunity to build a business really for the first time. We uh, had the opportunity with Western Wireless starting in the late 80s to build a business in rural areas. But in many ways, VoiceStream was special and it was different because while the other businesses were the first provider of services in their communities, we generally provided services to business and we were really focused on businesses and meeting the needs of those kinds of customers. It was viewed as a productivity tool. The introduction of digital, the ability to dramatically increase capacity were some of the keys to the opportunity that we saw at VoiceStream. With the original GSM technology, we were able to deliver a service that worked for consumers. And I've always viewed that the heart of VoiceStream was a consumer model and the opportunity to meet consumer needs. And it was also entrepreneurial. You know, the, the group of folks were competing against the giants. By that time, AT&T and Verizon had, had their roots and had scaled up. And so for us, we were always the little guy competing against the big guy. And to me, that's what VoiceStream still is. I'm enormously proud of the fact that T-Mobile's name is on this building. I'm enormously proud of the fact that every time I see people in magenta tees in the ballpark, I go over and talk to them and, and you know try to get to know them and hear what T-Mobile's about. And because of you, Mike, and people like Fryer and Mike and, and Dave Miller and Dow Draper and John Saw, so many people go back 20 years and understand the business and understand that at its heart, it's an entrepreneurial company and its heart, it's focused on customers. And if you focus on customers, we call them fans here in the ballpark. I know that you can succeed and you, you guys have obviously succeeded well beyond my wildest dreams. Yeah, well, you know, I, it's a huge credit to you that the things that you said, being, being the scrappy underdog, the, the relentless focus on customers, 
you know, those, those things started with Voicetree, but they're still deeply, deeply wound into the DNA of the company. And, and in a world now where we're a much bigger company and we're competing against, you know, some of the biggest companies in the world, it still is the thing that makes us different from everybody else. And it's, it's amazing that it started with, you know, this small regional company with Voicetree. It's just, just amazing. Um, you know, I know, I know you stay really close to the wireless industry, both, you know, from all, all of your background with, with, with Western and Voicestream, and then a lot of the work that you do as an investor. Um, we're going through a big technology transformation in, in wireless right now as we move from 4G to 5G services. What, what excites you about the possibility of 5G? I guess I'd use the word ubiquity. Um, you know, I actually still have a, a business I'm involved in called Trilogy International. We operate a wireless system in New Zealand. And one of the things to appreciate is how extensive 5G is going to be on a global basis. And getting there first matters. Whether you're in Auckland, New Zealand, or in New York City, or, or right here in Seattle, the speed to service matters. And I'm so proud of the fact that the T-Mobile team has taken the ball and run with it, or that's more of a football analogy. Maybe I should say you've thrown a great pitch. Um, and you know the, the strength of that really makes a difference at the end for users. Um, users may be defined as, as devices in many cases with the importance of, uh, of IoT, the ability to deliver 5G caliber capable videos and to be able to do some of the things that, that we're looking at here with AR and VR in the ballpark. Imagine going to a baseball game and looking down and seeing uh, J.P. Crawford out at shortstop and not being sure as to what his stats are and to be able to tap your glasses and see the stats to be able to see the last play or to be able to order another hot dog without having to leave your seats. All those things enabled by a technology that provides ubiquity and depth of capacity that's inherent in 5G. Yeah, you, you talk about some of these fan experiences, which I'd, I'd love to hear if there's, there's more that you think um, we're on the cusp of and that will come into, into baseball. Is there anything in the way baseball is, is operated or played that you, that you think 5G or other technologies are, are meaningfully gonna change here over the next few years? There are really two different things that I think about. One is the fan facing, really the business of baseball. Some of the things like AR and VR and the ability to take advantage of those, uh, those techniques that, that will give a more rich experience to our fans when they come to the ballpark. There are also training mechanisms we use that, that baseball has probably changed more in the last 10 years than it had in the prior 100 years in terms of the way we train athletes and we're able to get those athletes to, to position themselves on the field as a defender, to be able to take the right launch angle, to be the angle with which the bat strikes the ball, to be able to, to vary the location and this, uh, the uh, velocity of pitches, all of those things are technology enabled. We, we train with them. We have right now a camera system, the six camera system that allows us to maybe someday get to the point where we're using a, a computer to call balls and strikes. They'll do it a lot more accurately than some of the umpires that have called our games. I'm probably getting in trouble for that. But you know, the opportunity for, for players to reduce injuries, to be able to um, uh, understand, for example, if a, uh, uh, one of the things we do right now is we look at stress and strain on players, and we know that there are predictors of injury. Technology enables us to know then if a player is about to be injured or they're, they're stressing themselves too hard to take that player off the field and either have the uh, player DH be the designated hitter for a night or maybe just have a night off. And in doing those things, we're able to, to frankly reduce one of the most insidious and, and uh, expensive elements of our business, and that is injuries. Yeah. Well, one of the things I wanted to ask you about, because we're still you know, 18 months into this pandemic, and it, it feels like baseball in particular has done a really wonderful job man, managing through it. Um, what, what, what do you think have been some of the keys to keep, uh, to keep baseball operating at a really, really high level to keep fans coming into, uh, into the stadium? Can you talk a little bit about you know, what some of the successes come out of that and, and what role has technology played? On March 10th, 2020, I got a call from the governor saying, John, we'd like you to move just your first 10 games to your training facility in Arizona. And I said, Governor, we'll, we'll do that. 
I just want you to know that when it's time to come back, whether that's in April or I had no idea how long it would be later, we'll be there and baseball will help bring this community back. And I believe we've done that. I believe that all of the teams in baseball have done that. And I think that the opportunity that baseball has is to bring us together. Baseball's about community. Baseball's about family. You know, when you go to a, a football game or a basketball game, you, you tend to have more um, action at times and fewer breaks. There are fewer times where you can have a conversation. It's the reason baseball is so good for businesses to get to know their customers better. And so for us, we represent an opportunity to bring that communal family feeling to people. And I think we've done that well. How we did it, you know, is really enormous amount of effort, effort and investment behind the scenes. You know, every player, every person that comes in contact with a player had to be tested at least every other day. We've had systems in place to make sure that there are social distancing on the field in the clubhouse and also in the stands. We started this season with fans having to be socially distanced at least six feet apart. So we blocked off rows and seats. We only, we have a stadium that'll hold 46,000 and we only had capacity for 8,800 at the beginning of the season because we wanted to make sure everyone was safe. We went to packaging, separate packaging for items at the concession stand. We had a system whereby you could order in many sections off your phone, thanks to T-Mobile, uh, to order food and we'd have it brought to you because that was a safer way to, to address it. We even had queuing systems in the restrooms in order to make sure that we were able to make every person's experience not only fun, but safe. And, and technology plays a role, that we have the ability because of the testing technology. You know, we have a, a testing center in baseball and we've used that to communicate to, to players on the field um, before they get on the field um, if they tested positive. Uh, during the uh, worst parts of the pandemic, every player kept and, and every executive um, had a device in their pockets that would then uh, alert them if they tested positive who their close contacts were over the prior 24 hours. That literally there'd be a database, you'd push a button and you could instantly get to the uh, uh, people who had close contact to make sure they were tested. And all of those things resulted in uh, uh, the uh, number of people who tested positive inside a baseball to be less than one-tenth of a percent. And you know, our ability to control the outbreaks in 2020 really has resulted in, excuse me, in 2021 has resulted in very, very few games having to be even postponed or affected. Last year, we um, uh, were playing, every team played 60 games. So uh, out of a total of 900 games that, that were scheduled to be played, 898 games got played. Only two games ended up not being played during the season. It's a tribute to the hard work. It's a tribute to the passion that people had to bring the game back. It's also a tribute to technology. Yeah. Kind of speaking of that contrast between last season, 2020 and 2021, what, it, what has it meant to the players and the coaches to play in front of people again? Um, I can say from my perspective, I was a little bit bummed because I had the best seats all season long last year. I was like right behind, my cutout was right behind home plate. Um, but what, what has it meant uh, for, for the players to be back in front of fans again? The, uh, the Seattle Times ran a picture of me because I was one of the very few people in the ballpark last year. I always keep score at games and amid a sea of cardboard cutouts, there was me with my little <laughs> score pad in the sixth row of the Diamond Club to, uh, watching a game. There's just no comparison. It, the, the game last year, we played, and it was important for the TV audience and the people at home to have that entertainment. But in the ballpark, it was sterile. Um, it just didn't feel real in the sense of the passion that people have. Um, 8,800 people, which we had on opening day, sounded like 46,000. It was a lot of fun. We had a lot of people here, but now that we're up you know, in the 20 to 30,000 on most games, it really is loud, it's really fun. And I will tell you, you know, what players and coaches have said to me, we get a competitive advantage when we're playing in T-Mobile Park with a group of fans that are passionate. And that's what our fans are, they are passionate. Yeah. 
they certainly are. It was I was here on opening day and it was great. Uh, I thought it was just the players were great, the atmosphere was great, and it was a great game. Um, you, you've done so many things in your career, um, you know, entrepreneurial things, a big executive at big companies, and now running uh, a, a baseball franchise. What, what, what it, well, first of all, what's it like to run a baseball team? And then, you know, what, what are some of the experiences that you've taken from all the things you've done in the past to make, um, you know, to make running a baseball team successful? Well, first of all, it's a small business, right? That, that you know, we have about 300 full-time employees, not counting players. Um, you can actually get to know all those folks. I remember when VoiceStream, what's now T-Mobile, had, had 300 employees, and I knew all of them. And you know the the chance to know all the people makes all the difference in the world. To to make it personal, that this isn't a business in the sense that that you know you you have profit and loss. You do, but in general, it's people aren't doing it for the money. They're doing it for the passion. And and for me, I mean, last night we won a game. I was able to tax back and forth with our pitcher mark. Pitcher Marco Gonzalez and our, our shortstop uh, JP Crawford, both of whom had great games last night. I care. At the core, I'm a fan. And I think that, that though I've also learned things, you know, I was in a meeting this afternoon talking about people, and I reflected back on the high performance groups that we um, worked on with VoiceStream and T Mobile to try to identify people who had great potential in the organization to take on a bigger leadership role and to take that kind of an approach and use it here at the Mariners. We have a, uh, it's a smaller group, but we have a group of people who I think have the potential to go on to much bigger roles. We need to help those people realize their opportunity and to, to do more with us. In baseball, it may mean that they go to another team in order to uh, to succeed or they and they may come back to us again, but help people be better, do better job, and enjoy themselves. But it, at, at the core, you know, what I always tell our people here is it's about having fun. And that's the thing I always remember about our time with Voice Stream. Yeah. When, when you go into a season, and when, you, when you're working with the team and planning a season, how, how do you measure success? Especially with where the Mariners are, because it's been really great to watch the progression for the last couple of years. And this season has been amazing to watch because the team is just so fun to watch and they've had so much success. But when you, when you finish this season, you look back, what are the things that you're going to point to and say that was a successful season? Well, it, it, frankly, it took me a couple of years to, to really develop my own view with respect to how to measure success and to how to think about it. As with all things, success is based on your expectations. Do you think you can do this? Do you think you can achieve that? And for us, we decided three years ago that we were in a position where we couldn't achieve our goal of winning a World Series with the team and the strategy that we had used and the Mariners had used for 20 years. We concluded that we needed to take a different approach and we wanted to build on a core group of younger players and accumulate as many young players as we possibly can and then bring them up in waves. Don't be tempted to trade away those good young players but you need to supplement them in some cases with free agents. So for us, success this year is we'll win, we hope to win 91 games and be in the playoffs, but we've already have a winning season. There are many pundits that, and many people, frankly, at the Mariners who didn't think that was possible with this young group of players. I look at the success in the minor leagues. We have six minor league teams, including a team in the Dominican Republic and a what we call a developmental team down in uh, down in Peoria. All six of those teams had winning records this year. The, our AAA team in Tacoma won the championship for the first time in a decade. I think that those all represent important success. But at its core, it's about individual players. And I look at how our individual players develop. I look at bringing up Jared Kellenick, uh, Logan Gilbert, Cal Raleigh, introduce them to the major leagues, and I look at the successes they've had during the arc of their first year in baseball. And I look at some of the players that we've got in the minor leagues today, and I think we have the same potential to do that. And I believe that we will continue to be able to ramp up our expectations and then beat those expectations. And I believe we can win a World Series right here in Seattle in T-Mobile Park. Yeah, wow, we, we can't wait. I, I mean, you have to have so much optimism after watching the season and seeing some of the some of the guys that you just talked about, Kelnick, 
uh, Gilbert, and then looking at some of the guys you have in the farm system, combined with the fact that you know you had, um, I'm, I'm hoping that Kyle Lewis is still progressing and he's going to be back next season. So, you know, how much optimism does that have you uh, as you roll in, out of this season into next season? I've got a lot of optimism, and injuries are part of baseball. I I, I saw Kyle a couple of times in the last couple of weeks. Um, he is working really hard to get back on the field. Evan White's another another player. Evan was a, a, a Gold Glove winner, uh, developed, had that first year of uh, major league service, you know, and and struggled a little bit at the plate, but but played tremendous defense. He ca- has uh, has the ability to come back next year. We have a number of other younger players. Um, Shed Long. It's another player who was injured. But what we've been able to do is supplement those injured players with additional players. And we're going to lose some uh, some veterans over time. It happens. It's inevitable as players retire. Um, but we're prepared to spend some money and to bring additional players on to supplement those young players with some leadership and talent and blend that together in a mix that we think will produce winning baseball. Yeah. Well, it's been fun to watch. And I think you know better than anybody else. You have a whole community that's behind this team. And it's been really fun to come into the stadium this year and see how jazzed up this this uh, these fan, this fan base is about this team. And we're looking forward to hosting the 2023 All-Star Game right here yeah. in T-Mobile yeah, Park. Yeah, I was going to ask you about the, that. The 2023 All-Star Game in T-Mobile Park with the T-Mobile Home Run Derby. Like, what absolutely. It, like that's got to be a full circle moment for you. Yeah, we've yeah. already established a cottage industry of trying to figure out which of our players will get the opportunity to play in, or hit in the Home Run Derby. Um, how many of our uh, young, talented players will have developed to the point that they'll be selected as all-stars. And I think we're going to have a number of players with uh, Mariner caps on playing on that uh, American League all-star team. I'm incredibly excited. And what people don't fully appreciate is it's more than just a game and a home run derby. There are a series of events in this community, concerts, a fun run, opportunity to use Play Ball Park, which is a, uh, uh, a youth uh, uh, program you can bring your four kids to, Mike, and have the opportunity to have fun and um, get to love the game of baseball. And I think that we're going to be um, uh, we're bringing people to Seattle on what is usually the best week of the year, the middle of July, on a sunny day on you know to the most beautiful city in the country and uh to show them off in the most beautiful ballpark in america yeah we can't wait we call that recruiting season exactly uh, (laughs) um so john if you don't mind i've got some rapid fire questions for you i'm gonna look at my screen here so i remember them all um you're you are a washington native so what's your favorite seattle coffee shop well i have to confess generally it's the closest Starbucks that I can get to. It's, uh, I, I'm a hometown boy. Okay. Are you morning or night person? I'm really more of a morning person. I used to be a night person when I was young, but now I uh, generally am in bed by eight o'clock unless there's a baseball game on. Yeah. You may have given this away a little bit when you were talking about, uh, talking with Marco and team last night, but are you talk or text? Um, personally, I'm talk, but as a practical matter, with our players or with my two sons, text is a much more effective way of getting their attention. Yeah, actually getting them to reply. Exactly. Uh, Bull Durham or Field of Dreams? Field of Dreams. Yeah. And I had the opportunity <laughs> to go to the game this year in Iowa with my younger son. And it, it's maybe the best baseball experience I've ever had. Yeah, that was really cool. I hope that's a tradition that they, that they keep going for a while. Uh, favorite comfort food? Um, Probably mac and cheese. Beecher's mac and cheese is hard to beat. It's yeah. it's it's hard to uh, uh, deal with the uh, weight gain that it usually accompanies <laughs> it. But uh, I'll take my mac and cheese. And then favorite baseball position, either to watch or like when you were playing. Well, I was always a first baseman. Uh, I had the speed to be a first baseman when I uh, when I played. I did not have a very successful uh, career. Um, I have to confess, watching a game, uh, I'm. I like to be uh, just off of behind home plate. Uh, you get a better view of the pitcher. Uh, particularly, I, I tend to uh, uh, I tend to uh, be on the uh, uh, what here is the third base side because you get a better view of the right-handed pitchers. Um, you get a sense as to uh, uh, where the uh, uh, catcher's positioning and how the uh, uh, the players are uh, are uh, attacking the uh, pitcher. This one may be too long to qualify for rapid fire, but the, the people want to know, so I have to ask. 
Um, back in 98, when you were CEO of Voicestream, your favorite part-time seasonal employee, like, you know, in the Fort Collins, Colorado area? Um, well, there was this young guy who had uh, a successful college baseball career before he got injured um, named, I think it was Mike Katz or something like that. And, you know, he was just terrific. And I understand that he's, uh, he's managed to keep his job over the last few years. Uh, thanks. Thank you for humoring me, John. Um, I I can't appreciate. I can't tell you how much I appreciate this. This has oh, been this such has been such fun. a highlight for me, and it's so uh, it's so wonderful to get that opportunity to speak to you and, and watch what amazing things that you've done. Well, the only thing we missed today is the uh, the teams on the road. Yeah. Uh, if we uh, if it was a little later, uh, and uh, the team was in town, uh, we could sit and watch a game yeah. together. Uh, I, I would have loved that, and I, I will. I will definitely be back in this park this year because this is this is one of my family's favorite places. Okay. So thank you well, again thank so you. much, John. As a reminder, for each episode of this season of Taking Care of Business, we're excited to expand our Project 10 Million donation to a school district of our guest choice, making further progress toward bridging the gap and ensuring that every child in America has equal access to reliable, high-speed connectivity. To our listeners. Thank you for joining us, and we'll see you next time on Taking Care of Business.